after a special like that, I have to say, I'm glad I'm getting to preach and not here. God loves you. That's good stuff right there. Thank you, Mark. Turn to your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew. And look at a, what probably for most of you is a popular or a well-known uh, passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 28, we're going to cover verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Have you enjoyed the rain? Yes. yes. All right. yes. It's been good, hasn't it? Yeah. Of course, with the rain, you got to take the humidity that comes along with it. <laughs> and then that causes allergy issues for certain ones. And so if my voice gets a little scratchy this morning, that's the reason why. But that'd be all right, because we're going to have a good time in God's Word this morning. One of the things that excited me this week was... The first afternoon of camp, well, end of the first evening was over, and Steve posted on his on the Haven Heights Facebook page six rings of the bell. Yeah. Amen. That was exciting. Amen. That's one of those glory to God moments, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. When you when you say thank you, Lord Jesus, for doing again what you set out to do all those years ago, and that was to to return people to you. Amen. That are in their sins and they come to understand the truth of the gospel and they turn their lives over to the Lord. That's an awesome time. And then, of course, when one of our own uh, was uh, able to ring the bell. That's another glory to God for what he's doing in our lives. Now comes the an extremely involved process for all of those. You see, ringing the bell is the first step for those that have believed. Then comes baptism. Then comes discipleship. And that's an involved process. In fact, I have been involved in the process of discipleship now for as long as I can remember because I grew up in Sunday school and then when I surrendered to the ministry and I went through training and got a Bible degree and went to seminary, that's been my whole life has been discipleship. Pastor Steve knows. He understands what I'm talking about. And it will, somebody asked me, are, are you planning on retiring soon? And I said, are you serious? <laughs> Pastors don't retire. We That's just right. get old. That's right. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> it's a lifelong process. Yes, it is. Of, of learning to live for the Lord. And I want to share some things with you about that topic this, this morning. The title of the sermon is Teaching Them. Teaching Them. And I see I didn't get my title to Marla in time this morning, or she could have slapped that on the screen up there. But the title of the sermon is Teaching Them. And, and we focus, when we look at the, the Great Commission, that's what we're covering this morning. When we look at that, the big things are going, missions work, making disciples, <laughs> baptizing people. But we often forget the third step of the commission. And that's teaching them. And that's just as important as the other two. It cannot be de-emphasized. It has to be there as well. So we're going to look at these verses of scripture now. And I hope that when we're done, you'll have a better understanding of what discipleship's about and, and teaching them. And so... If you've got the scriptures there, Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. These are the words of Jesus. Well, starting verse 16 is some commentary uh, telling us what's going on. And, and Matthew writes, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. You know why there's only eleven disciples mentioned? Judas. Who was the, yeah, Judas. Judas was the twelfth. And he committed suicide after he had betrayed Jesus to the, to the Jewish leaders. And so this is after that time. And so the 11, in, in obedience to what Jesus had told the women at the tomb on that morning, he said, go tell my disciples that I will meet them on the mountain in Galilee. Well, that's where they've gone. And so Jesus goes to them in verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some... We're doubtful. Do you 
imagine there was some confusion on the part of the disciples as to what exactly was going on? I think that's probably where they were. Verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying these words. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You've probably heard lots of sermons on the Great Commission. I've, read, I've had lots of sermons that I've sat under on the Great Commission. I've also read that passage of Scripture more times than I can remember. But sometimes when you read a passage, something just jumps off the page at you that you have not thought about before. And that's what happened with me a few weeks ago. I was reading, this, reading through the Gospel of Matthew again, and I came across this, this verse as it closed out, and that word teaching them, that phrase, just jumped off the page at me. And so being a Bible student, Steve knows what I'm talking about right here. I, I had to get my, my Bible program that I have that I use. It's not a program. I, you, anybody can use it. It's online. It's called Bible Hub. That's what I use when I want to look some stuff up. And so I pulled Bible Hub up on the, on the computer, and I started looking at the Greek and just uh, doing some analysis on it. I found some commentary on it that I printed part of it off and was just wondering, Exactly what does it mean when he says teaching them? And so I, I filed that away for future reference. Well, and then when Steve asked me the other day to, to preach this morning, there was the future reference coming out, mm -hmm. Brother David. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to use that topic that I've been looking at to share with you some thoughts this morning. Now, here's something else that i got to tell on myself, and, and why I am this way, I don't know. Maybe Angel can help you out on <laughs> understanding that. But as I was thinking on that some more this week and was putting the sermon together, a couple of songs popped into my mind. Neither one of them are religious or Christian songs. In fact, one of them was written by a guy, reportedly, he, he in an interview, said he was high on dope when he wrote the lyrics to the song. It's called Teach Your Children. You remember that old folk song from the early 70s? Teach Your Children Well. Okay. And, and it's, a, it's a beautiful song because it was written in a turbulent time. And it's talking about how that children and parents need to teach each other and learn from each other. That's not far away from discipleship, you guys. Right. Amen. That, that this scripture is teaching us this morning and talk to me, talking to us about it was written during the Vietnam War uh, through an upheaval of society when parents and children were not trusting of one another. In fact, that's where the, the term came out during the early, late 60s, early 70s by the, the rebellious generation of that time. And if you're part of that generation, no offense meant by that, by that phrase, okay? But the, their term that they used was never trust anyone over 30. You remember that phrase? So, so this song was written during that time, and it was trying to encourage people not to be involved in war. And in fact, one of the things that was a catalyst for this guy to write these lyrics was he said he saw a photo that a photographer had taken of an eight-year-old boy in Central Park, New York, with an angry expression on his face, and in his hand he was holding a toy grenade. And he said, the thought occurred to me, there's got to be a better way of teaching kids. And this was some of the motivation for the lyrics. And then I thought about another song. I, sometimes I'm just driving down the road and these songs hit me and I don't know why it is that way. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, God, why is it that way? But back to, back to when I was a little kid, there was a Saturday morning cartoon show that came on this tube and it was called Fat Albert and the Gang. <laughs> And the, the phrase that hit me in that song is that he says, learning from each other while we do our thing. Nah, 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 going to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a freebie. 
good to have fun in it. <laughs> but that was, and, and the show was all about teaching good things. The principles that that Saturday morning show taught emphasized good things. You might even say they emphasized godly things. Now, we all know that Bill Cosby has had major issues and has spent time in prison, just in fact, got out of prison not too long ago because of things that he took liberties with. And, and so, but that's beside the point. There are things that we need to look at this morning. And while these songs' messages don't emphasize God in them, they do encourage the learning and teaching of godly things. It's good for parents and children to teach and learn from each other. And it's good for us to be in a group setting where we're learning from each other. I'll have more to say about that here in a few minutes as well. The emphasis, I think, of the passage on teaching in verse 20 is showing us that it is an essential part of the command that Jesus gives to his disciples. In fact, I want to tell you this morning, I want you to understand that Jesus' commission in these words that he gives us calls us to, to a lifelong commitment to teaching and learning from each other about godly living. It's vital. It's something that we all need to be involved in. And I'll have more to say about that as well here in just a couple of minutes. First thing I want us to do this morning with this passage is just look at the setting and the timing of the text. We learned in verse 16 that Jesus is going to meet with his disciples on Gal in Galilee on the mountain. And he had told the women at the tomb to tell the disciples to meet him there. And so they're having this meeting. So it's after his resurrection, but before his ascension. In fact, the ascension is recorded in, in the last few verses of, of Luke chapter 24 and verse 51 specifically, and also Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We have the ascension of Jesus taking place, 8 and 9. And the disciples were still confused. When they were on the Mount of Olives with Jesus, just as he was going to uh, go back to the Father in the clouds, they, the disciples were asking him, is this the time? Is it now that you're going to establish the kingdom? They were still thinking in terms of the kingdom of God on earth. About the Jewish nation being supreme and being, being the focal point of God's dealings with the earth. And Jesus said, it's not my responsibility to appoint the times and the seasons. But it belongs to my father. And then he says in Acts 1 8, but you will receive power. Amen. And you shall be my witnesses. Beginning in Jerusalem and in Judea and unto Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what Jesus was saying to the disciples. He was saying, I don't know what the kingdom's going to start right now. God the Father's decided that. But here's what you need to do. You remember I mentioned a moment ago <clears throat> that the disciples were confused. They've been with Jesus three years. That's come to an end. He's died. He's been buried. He's been resurrected. And now he's about to go back to the Father. And he's been telling them all of this for a while. But they still don't completely understand. What's my next step? I think some of the disciples were, were wondering what their next plan of action should be. What, what, where should we go from here? What should we do from now on? And Jesus is just simplifying it for them, I think. When he says, here's what you are going to do. You're going to go to the nations and you're going to make disciples of them. You know what making a disciple is? Leading them to follow Jesus. What went on at Kids Camp this week was all about going and making disciples. It was about getting young men to, and young women in grade school and other age to come to the place to where they understand their sinfulness and their need of Jesus and to give their heart and life to him. That's what camp's about. Evangelism and getting kids to know Christ as their Savior. But that's not the end of the process, is it? In fact, that's just the beginning of the process. That's right. <clears throat> then comes the teaching. And so I think Jesus was just trying to eliminate the confusion on the part of the disciples as to the future. 
They were filled with doubt and misunderstanding and were trying to make sense of it all. And so Jesus was taking away their confusion. So in doing this, what is he saying to them? This passage of scripture, this commission that he gives to the disciples, what is he saying to them? Well, let's notice some things that we should note from the text about teaching and about carrying out this commission. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is that the teaching part comes after evangelism and disciples and, and uh, baptism. Comes after evangelism and baptism. So the parts of the command basically are going, making disciples, baptizing them, and then teaching them. Those are the parts of the commission. And all of those parts of the commission are, if you, any of you English scholars in here, they're all present participles. And what that means is, is that they imply continuous action. This is something you are doing now and you will continue doing for as long as you are breathing air on this earth. Amen. You are going to be discipling. And so it talks about going, making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them. And so as you are going, he's saying, make disciples of all the nations. What is he getting at there? Let me say it like this. This, this would be a kind of a paraphrase interpretation of this verse. He's saying, as you are living life as a disciple of mine, as a follower of me, then go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them. That's what Jesus is saying to his disciples on this mountain in the region of Galilee. <coughs> is any one part more important than the others? No. No. We cannot emphasize one over the other. That's right. It is important to go missions. It is important to evangelize evangelism. It is important to baptize people. The scriptures teaches that. Jesus gave us the example. It's important to do so, but it is just as important to teach them to observe all that Jesus has commanded. So when you talk about it like that, here's something we need to understand. We cannot emphasize too much the leading of people to make the decision to become a follower of Jesus. We cannot emphasize too much the sealing of the decision with the biblical testimony of baptism. But the ones who are to be taught are the ones who have become disciples. They've become followers of Jesus. He's not saying if you're already a disciple, teach these others. He's saying as you are making disciples, baptize them and teach them. Amen. So teaching is a vital part of the process. Pastor Steve will understand this phrase when I, when I mention it, but in preacher circles, we refer sometimes to churches who are big on evangelism and small on discipleship and follow-up as ministries that are dripping and dropping them. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Steve? That means we emphasize getting them to follow and trust Jesus by making a profession of faith and then baptizing them, and then that's it. Nothing else is done with them. We say, okay, you know, get into a Sunday school class and study these words, study your book each week, and, and come to church each week. And that's all we say to them about learning to observe the commands of Jesus. It's a whole lot more than that, y'all. To getting people to understand and learn what it means to live as a believer. Years ago, when I was in Colorado, I had opportunity to go to a Billy Graham School of Evangelism. And one of the seminars I went to was led by a fellow named Ron Hutchcraft. He has a ministry out of Harrison, Arkansas that he, that he does. And he's on Facebook if you wanted to follow him on Facebook, he, he just, he's, he know, he's just got it. He knows, he just knows it. You know, he's one of those guys. And he made a statement in that seminar I went to. He said, fellas, he said, here's something you've got to realize. If you're wanting to grow your church, here's the deal. God is not going to give his new babies in the faith to a church that is not ready to take care of them. That's right. 
I did the same thing y'all did. I went, wow. That's eye-opening. He's going to give them to a church who is prepared to disciple them in a lifelong process to help them know what it means to love God and live for him on a daily basis. And so we've got to be prepared. We've got to be ready for the Lord to trust, his, trust us with his new babies in the faith. And so the teaching part comes after evangelism and baptism. Also, a second thing to note here is the commands of Jesus are the content of the teaching. So Jesus says, teaching them to observe what? All the things that I've commanded you. Yeah. What was given and taught to the original apostles by Jesus himself is what we're to teach others. Teaching them these things. And I'm going to go so far as to say, I think, that also includes the writings of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul was called as an apostle, he says. And he saw Jesus, he was alive when Jesus was ministering on earth, but he was not a follower at that time. But then God stopped him on the road to Damascus, and, and Paul became a disciple, he became a follower, and Jesus appointed him as an apostle to the Gentiles. That's right. <laughs> And so when you read the writings of Paul, you're reading the commands of Christ that Paul's writing there by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so what I see here again is Jesus simplifying the process. And, and I think sometimes we try to overcomplicate or we complicate the process because we emphasize certain things and, and when we should be emphasizing other things. But there's a third uh, observation I want to make on the text here before I look at some principles this morning. The goal of the teaching is the practice of the commands of Christ. Yeah. And here's where we've complicated the process. It's not about knowledge per se. Mm -hmm. we, and, and, and I've been guilty of that. I've encouraged people, we need, you need to learn as much as you can from the scriptures. Read them and get into them. Yes, you need to learn scriptures, but that is not the goal of the teaching them to the, co the commands of Christ. The goal is for, to lead them to the place to where they understand the commands of Christ, but they also practice the commands of Christ. Have you ever wondered when, you're, when someone makes a profession of faith and they stick with it for a few weeks and then they're right back to their old lifestyle with their old friends doing their old thing that they want, wanted to do. But you've got another person who trusts Christ, gets saved, gets baptized, and starts being discipled, and it sticks with them. What's the difference between the two? You're teaching them the same things. The difference is, is how we approach the teaching. Mm. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself because this is one of the principles we're going to talk about in just a moment. But what we see happening here is that Jesus' goal for his commands was right living. His intention for his followers is to make disciples, yes, but then to train them, to teach them what it means to live as a disciple and to encourage the practice of those things they've learned. Amen. <laughs> so the emphasis that Jesus places by using the word observe here is meaning to keep an eye on these things, to guard these things, to give careful attention to. So one of the things we need to, to encourage new believers to do is to pay attention to what Christ is telling them to do and not just learn it, but to live it. In the past, and, and I've written discipleship materials myself, and the approach has kind of been, here, read this, answer these questions. And then when they get through with, say, eight weeks or 12 weeks of that, and they've read the, read the, the information, they've read these passages, they've answered the questions, okay, you've been discipled. And it's not that simple I'm learning. It's not that simple. And one of the things I think that, that hurts us the most it's when we get to the place of where Christians, they have the knowledge, but they don't see the need to live out the knowledge. And there's where the difference comes in, I think. 
Jesus wants us to keep the process simple, yes, but effective also. And out of these things that we note from the text, now let's go to the last thing. And I want to show you some principles that I think we need to learn this morning. So this first principle, and, and a principle that reminds you is a truth from God's word that will always be true. That, that's a principle that comes from God's word. So here's the first one I think we need to, to hear. Since Jesus has not returned from that day that he left from the Mount of Olives, the process has not ended. Right. It's still ongoing. We still need to be going. We still need to be evangelizing. We still need to be baptizing. And we still need to be teaching. Right. Amen. Jesus' last words to the disciples. I mentioned them a moment ago. Here and then in Acts 1.8. When he said, you're going to be my witnesses. When power from on high has come upon you. And you're going to go to all the parts of the earth. As my witness. So the process is not ended. Here's the second principle. Since this is an ongoing process. All believers should be involved. That's right. We all should be involved in the teaching them. There's no exception. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. Paul says to his son in the faith. His his, his disciple, his follower, but, but the follower of Jesus, he says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So it's still teaching. It's still being involved in the process. Our involvement is expected no matter what our age is. We never get too old to be involved in the process. We may not have the strength and the stamina physically to do what we once did. That's one of the hard things about growing older is learning that you just can't do what you used to do physically. But I can still be involved in the process of learning and training and teaching them to live like a believer should live. Amen. And here's how I say that and why I say it. Here's the third principle. Since our involvement is expected, and considering how God designed us to learn best in a group setting, we must be a part of a group whose purpose is Christian discipleship. Learning in, in the group dynamic is how God made us. It was last, I don't remember when now, been since we moved over to my daughter's house here in Fort Smith. Um, I'm part of a Facebook group called Oklahoma Discipleship. And I was on Facebook one day at the house, and, and I think this is before I came to work here back last fall, Steve. And uh, I saw a deal on Facebook from Oklahoma Discipleship. They were doing a, a, a free webinar on some stuff pertaining to uh, discipleship and that sort of thing with, with the church. And so I thought, well, I'm going to watch that. So I signed up for the free webinar and came time for it, and I watched it. And one of the things they were doing was interviewing and talking with a pastor out in Idaho who's written a new book called The Revolutionary Disciple. And uh, so I, I ordered that book and got it, The Revolutionary Disciple. I hadn't read it yet. Uh, I will be getting to it soon. But the premise of that book is talking about how that there's not enough humility in Christianity these days. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so the revolutionary disciple, but in passing, he mentioned another book. And it caught my eye, and so I, I, I also got it. It's called The Other Half of the Church. And I, I read through this book, and, and I got to tell you, Brother Randy, I, I loaned it to him, and he's read through it, and he can back me up on this. It is not easy reading. Because in this book, they're talking about how God has wired our brains to best learn and grow within a group setting. In fact, one of the statements that one of the author, authors make, makes, he says, and this is in light of the, of the blossoming of online worship services. He makes a statement. He says, you cannot get 
scientifically, and it's been proven through brain research and science, you cannot get the same experience watching a two-dimensional flat screen TV worship service that you're going to get sitting in a group worshiping the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ together. It's not going to happen. Because he talks about the light of our faces. And one of the things that I need to do is to see your smile. And one of the things that you need is to see my smile. And one of the things that I need to hear are your words of encouragement because of what God has done in your life. And one of the things that you need to hear is what God's done in my life and how I can encourage you through those things as well. And you cannot get that watching a, show, watching a television show, basically, that's a worship service and tweeting or liking or commenting on the social feed that's going on. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here this morning because you guys are all here, right? <laughs> but hopefully I've given you some, some cannon fodder here. I've given you some ammunition that you can tell people. Go get the book. Read the other half of the church. It's going to be a struggle, I can tell you, to read it because they're talking language that I don't normally talk. And I would have to read some paragraphs two or three times to be sure I understood what they were saying when he got to describing the brain science involved. But here's, let me put it into a nutshell here for you. The premise they're making in this book is that you and I need to be in a group because of how God has wired our brains to experience the group dynamics. And you and I need to be in a group based on scripture Simply because Christ realizes that way as well. Let me take you to a little passage of scripture that you've probably heard before. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir one another up unto good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But encouraging one another and even so more as you see the day approaching. So if you're watching me from home right now, I'm not hammering you necessarily, but I am encouraging you. It's time to come back and get in God's house. Amen. You, you may or may not get COVID. I don't know. Thank the good Lord. I don't know how I have avoided getting it, but Angela had COVID here about a month ago. And, and I hadn't had the first symptoms. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. My cardiologist told me, you don't need to get it. And I'm thanking the Lord that I haven't got it. And the glory goes to him and him alone. But I said that to say this. I don't know if I'll get COVID or not. But it doesn't matter if I know I will get COVID or not. I can't live in fear. Amen. Now, I can take precautions when necessary, and I, I quarantine my, my uh, suggested time with uh, having been exposed with, with Angela there and, and her having COVID. I stayed home, stayed away from the office until, until I was uh, past the time recommended to quarantine, and then I came back into the office. Sunday school is vital. And whether we call it Sunday school or small groups or life groups or connect groups or, or whether it be a Sunday morning worship service, it is time to gather together again no matter what may come. We need the teaching. We need the learning within a group dynamic. Because sometimes I'm going to mess up. And I need someone to look at me and say, what are you thinking? <laughs> That's not how Christians act. That's not how believers conduct themselves in being a follower of Christ. I need that. We all need that. And you cannot get that by watching a worship service on the screen. So if you're not involved in a Sunday school group this morning, I encourage you to find one here in the church. Talk to me afterward. I'll get you hooked up with a group. You need that group dynamic. You need it. To help you grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I bring it to a close and I say this again. Jesus calls his followers and expects us to be part of the lifelong process of teaching each other how to follow Christ. 
So get involved in a group. Come back to church. Enjoy the company of each other. Amen. Have a good time. Enjoy the fellowship. And learn from each other. That's what I have to say to you this morning. Amen. Let's bow together. Father, I bless your name this morning. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And the love that he showed to us by giving his life on the cross of Calvary. Lord, your wisdom and your understanding just simply blows me away. How you could do that. That amazing grace, amazing love that I would benefit from what you've done because I know what I'm in and I know what I'm like. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving this young lady at camp this week and all of the other campers that you saved at camp at Siloam this week. God, I give you glory for that. And I pray for your help this morning for every person involved in the process of discipling these young people. Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to disciple them, to teach them what it means to live as a follower of Christ. Lord, may we never de-emphasize holy living and right living. But we need each other, Father, and I pray that you would lead us to be together once again. I ask you, Lord, to lead people to respond to you this morning in this time of invitation as, as you desire for them to respond, whether it be to to pray in the altar, whether it be to talk with Brother Steve, whatever you're doing, Father, I pray for the freedom of your spirit to move in our hearts. And we give you the praise for whatever you do in Christ's name. Amen.